and we'll just hope that I'm in focus. That's hopefully you can all hear and see me. Hello, beautiful people. My name is Amanda Zitto. If you are new here, I make travel vlogs, how to's, and general encouragement for you to get out and do the thing. I just finished just and oh god, there's no. <laughs> and there's always some kind of technical difficulty. That's just part of live streaming with me. <laughs> I just got back from an 8,000 mile loop of the United States that I dubbed Flight of the Magpie. If you have missed any of the prep series or the three episodes that I did live from the road, I will link um, the playlist above my head somewhere for those who are watching this after the stream. <laughs> I actually did 7,929 miles, um, and minus my two zero days, I averaged 360 miles a day for 22 days, so I was on the road in total for 24 days. <laughs> my longest day was 760 miles from uh, Memphis, Tennessee to Amarillo, Texas, and my last day on the road was 608 miles from Jackpot, Nevada to Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm going to start with the questions that I have from people who couldn't make it here today, and then I will uh, jump into the chat and start answering questions from there. Hello, everybody! Lee the Rogue is here! That's awesome! Hi! It's so good to see you guys! Ken here, awesome, fantastic, sounding good, yay! <laughs> Georgia, Florida, all over the place! You left the keys in the bike ignition. <laughs> Thanks! May hello! Oh, Small Adventures is here! Hello, beautiful people! Yay! Excellent! And if you hear any sniggers or giggles from the corner, I would like to let you all know that my mom is sitting in the corner of my office out of shot of the camera, so she's here to um, heckle me in the midst of the stream, so it should it's be a good job. time. Everybody say hello to Mama Zitto in the corner! <laughs> hello! <laughs> And today I have Coke and um, some slow and low rye whiskey uh, because of all of the requests for Amanda to have, have libations. So here we go. <laughs> all right, starting off with the questions that um, people who couldn't make it to the stream have asked. So I'm gonna start with Sean Innes. Uh, what distance would you consider a comfortable or average ride day? I'm trying to gauge how far I can go and get back within a week, but I don't want to make myself miserable or also miss out on highlights of the trip. Um, so this is like such a personal question, um, just to like give some base marks from my personal experience. On average, during the pilgrimage, I went about 175 miles a day. And that was very comfortable for me. I knew that I could stop however many times that I wanted to. I could see at least two or three like sites during the day. Um, but I also don't do a whole lot of strenuous hikes. Like I maybe stop for an hour, hang out, take some photos, look at the thing, and then I get back on the road. I feel like um, for a very like soft pace, like where you want to stop and see the sights and like not feel dead at the end of the day, like 175 miles is like a wonderful starting point. Um, for some people it's lower than that and that is absolutely okay. Um, some people it's higher than that. Um, for this trip, like I said, I averaged about 360 miles a day and I'm not gonna lie, I was pushing it, you know? <laughs> like I maybe stopped and like took photos like maybe twice a day and those were really short stops. They were like 10, 20 minutes or something like that. I had one break during the day that was an hour and I'm pretty sure at only one point in this whole trip did I actually get to where I was going in the daylight. And I was getting up at like 7.30 a.m., 8 a.m. and hitting the road by 9.10. And sometimes 11, um, if I felt really bitter about the price of a hotel, I would stay until I absolutely had to leave the hotel, so I felt like I was getting my money's worth out of it. Um, but yeah. And yeah, the only time that I ever actually like reached my campground in the daylight and was able to set my tent um, before it got dark was in West Virginia and that day was only like 200 and some miles and that was the day that I got to ride with on her bike. Um, or her two wheels I should say, I'm sorry Jess. <laughs> her two wheels I got to ride from her house uh, in Columbus to West Virginia for my campsite and that still was only like a 200 and some mile day. 
Um, oh, super chat, anonymous biker USA. Thank you so much for the super chat. Cheers, you guys. Anyway, I hope that that kind of answers the question. Um, moving on, Ghost Rider. If you made a trip like this before, would you prefer a bike more suited for touring comfort? Or I'm assuming you mean if I made a trip like this again, would I prefer a bike that's more suited for touring or comfort? Um, so I, this is like my second super long trip. Um, the pilgrimage was my first, like more than twenty, more than two thousand mile trip. Um, so the pilgrimage was six thousand miles. I started on the Honda Shadow, which most people would consider more of a touring specific bike. Um, as a cruiser, um, and then I switched about a week or so in and got um, my 1980 uh, Suzuki GS850. Not got, but I switched it in Montana, and I rode that around Montana. And depending on who you talk to, that's like a naked street bike that could be just be considered a vintage bike. Um, and honestly, I had more. Uh, pain and more issues ergonomically on the Honda Shadow than I did on the Suzuki. I had the stock handlebars in the Suzuki, so like the 80s vintage bikes, like the bars came up and like come like this, so like my wrists were always kind of bent at an odd ankle. That was a problem. Um, thankfully, that was before I broke my wrist, otherwise it would have been a much bigger problem. Um, this trip I took the CB500X and I had very little issues on this trip. I think the only part of my body that was really sore at the end of the day was like right here on my shoulders and that was from wearing my hydro pack. Like if I, f I would fill up my hydro pack when I left in the morning and then by noon I was fine because the water was empty <laughs> and then I would fill up the water again 3, 4 p.m. and then um, I would drink about half of it by the time that I got to where I was going at the end of the day. So having like two and a half liters on your back is a lot of weight. And so that was really where most of my pain was coming from was the hydro pack on my shoulders right here. Um, as far as ergonomics go, I think the CB500X fits me the best out of all of the bikes that I've owned. Even the Tiger, I used to get a lot of lower back pain on the Tiger. Um, and I have ridden um, like baggers and bigger cruisers like that when I was working at the dealership and they just don't really fit me. Um, forward controls really like jars up my knees and so I'll get like kind of some knee pain and I don't really get that on the Honda. Anyway, Mark, thank you so much for this super chat. Thank you. Cheers, you guys. I don't know if you're going to take a drink after this super chat. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I should answer that. <laughs> a drinking game keyword? No, because then you'll just, like, spam it. I would like to not be blackout drunk by the end of the stream. <laughs> okay. Um, short answer to that question was that, uh, no, I would not have preferred a different bike. I think the Honda did fantastic for my trip. Moving on, uh, Daryl Moffat has four questions, and I uh, excused it because all these questions are common questions that I've been getting on Instagram while I was on the trip. So starting with number one, what tires were you running to do 8,000 miles? So when I started the trip, I had the Continental TKC 70s, which is the tire that I ran on the Suzuki when I did the pilgrimage, and I was really happy with the performance on and off-road. Um, I only had the one set of TKC 70s on the la on the Suzuki for the whole of the pilgrimage. Um, I keep trying to say Lazarus, but I know that not everybody knows my bike's names. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I had one set of TKC 70s for the whole of the pilgrimage, and then um, for the start of this trip, uh, the TKC 70s that I had I put on last year in September, so they already had about 5,000 miles on them when I left for this trip. Um, I did have to change the rear uh, in Virginia because it had pretty much flattened out and uh, it was losing traction off-road. So I switched um, for the only tire that they had that would fit my bike, which was a Michelin Anarchy Adventure. And I've been really pleased with the performance on, on those tires. Um, so I think on the rear I got about 8,000 miles on the TKC 70s. And then on the front, I still, I stuck with the front for the whole trip. So the front has about 12,000 miles on it now, and it's just at the point where I need to change it. So 
I really love the performance of the Continentals, and I will probably be sticking with them. Um, and I'll probably change the rear back to a TKC-70 after I've uh, used up the rest of the Michelin. Um, my only complaint about the Michelin is that it makes a really weird noise. It's much louder than the TKC-70s going down the freeway. <laughs> that's, that's my main complaint about those tires. Eric, thank you so much for the super chat. Cheers, you guys. Okay, the second question Daryl had was, how well was your bottom doing after all of those miles? Um, my bottom has done like pretty much the same on every trip that I've been on, and Lazarus has a custom seat. I had the stock seat on the Shadow. I ran with the stock sheet. Stock sheet? <laughs> Thank you. I ran with the stock seat on the CV Powder X because I have... I rolled over 30,000 miles on the CV Powder X on this trip, and I have done all of those miles with the stock seat. I have zero complaints about it. I don't know if maybe I just have a little more, bit more cushion on my butt than a lot of other people do, so it just doesn't bother me. Um, I do have parts of the day where like I start to get sore, so then I move to one side of the seat and then I'll move to the other, and I think that maybe that's like something that I'm doing that other people aren't. Maybe, like, I move around while I'm riding more than other people seems to. And maybe that's part of the reason that I don't have as many bottom issues. Um, I did have one issue in um, Wisconsin because I hit two rainstorms back to back. And I didn't have time for my gear to dry out properly um, after the first rainstorm. So when I put my gear back on, there was a little bit of moisture inside of my suit. So I did develop uh, saddle sores on my thighs that day that I had to kind of take care of for the rest of the trip. But that is really the only issue. And that wasn't even on my butt. That was on my thighs from like the edges of my seat rubbing into my thighs and the moisture. You know how saddle sores happen. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for the super chat, Joe. I'm, I'm almost out of my first drink, you guys. We're not even how we're not even that far into this. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think like my biggest uh, encouragement is that like if your butt does start to get sore, that is your sign that you need to stop and stretch some. Because if your butt is sore, that means the rest of your muscles are probably super stiff as well, and that's when you need to get off the bike and do some stretches. And that's also like a big key to just doing longer miles in a day in general and not feeling super sore and stiff at the end of the day, is that like stopping on a regular basis, like making a point when you get to a gas station to get off of the bike and kind of like do some stretches, like move your arms, like make sure you're uh, rolling your shoulders, like stretching these muscles because you're sitting like this for an extended period of time. Um, that's just really <laughs> important to like not have your body freeze up on you halfway through a trip. <laughs> Um, was maintenance a big issue? Um, I really only had like two maintenance issues, which was the rear tire, which was taken care of really quickly. I stopped at Moto, Wi Moto Richmond in Virginia, and they had my rear tire taken off, the new one put on, in two hours. They were incredible. Um, they prioritized me because I was a traveler. I told them I was trying to get to the coast that day. They were just the most lovely humans. I have never had better customer service from a dealership ever in my life. Um, this first customer, the not first customer, first maintenance issue that I had was that my rear sprocket deteriorated much faster than I anticipated it doing. Um, so I had, I knew that I was going to have to change my chain and sprocket on the, on the trip at some point, but I had sent the, all those parts forward to Milwaukee. Um, Megan Stark was really, really wonderful and let me send them to her office for her to take care of so that when I got to her place, I would be able to change them when I got there. Well, I got to Montana and my rear sprocket was just toast. Um, yeah. It was you, uh, it was so bad that like the teeth had gotten thin enough that like they had started bending back. It was bad news. Um, it's, I took a whole afternoon calling every dealership between Missoula and Rapid City to try to find somebody who would be able to overnight a sprocket for me because nobody keeps those in stock. Everybody had my chain, but nobody had my sprocket. And uh, finally I found a shop in Rapid City. Um, I want to say it's Roscoe's. I, <laughs> and he bent, 
bent over backwards to help me. Like he had the parts overnighted. They were open on the weekends. So he kind of stuck them in a hidey hole so that when I got there on the weekend and they were closed, I'd be able to pick up my parts. Um, he was also absolutely amazing. And I dealt with some pretty awful customer service over the phone, just trying to find somebody to overnight parts for me. So um, he has a special place in my heart. <laughs> um, and Gary and I ended up changing my sprocket and chain in a KOA campground of all places. Mike, thank you for the super chat, Mike. Cheers. Yeah, one more and then I have to <laughs> make a new drink. Um, but other than that, I just, uh, I did a lot of chain maintenance. Um, I didn't end up changing my oil on the trip because it just didn't look like it needed it. I know a lot of people will be upset up with me about that. Um, people who uh, stick pretty uh, religiously to the manual would will complain about it. But um, the Honda did amazing. Like, ugh. for the amount of miles that she has on her and then being asked to do that amount of miles like continuously for like three weeks, uh, I think she did awesome. <laughs> Um, that was the last question. Were there any issues with the bike? I had no issues with the Honda whatsoever. Um, by the end of it, I was kind of like, wow, this was kind of like a very uneventful trip for me. <laughs> I seem to always have some kind of mechanical issue, whether it's burning my clutch or pet tots breaking or spiders crawling into my starter buttons, something. There seems to always be some kind of issue. And Briarios did absolutely incredible. Like besides having to change my chain sprocket and just doing like the rear tire, which are very normal things, there was absolutely no issue with the bike. She did amazing. I could not have asked for a better bike to do this on. I think a lot of people really underestimate the 500. At no point was I wishing that there was another gear. Like obviously she has struggles like when you're faced up against a direct headwind, but I don't know any bike under 900 cc's that doesn't have an issue with a headwind, you know? Even the Tiger has a major issue with a headwind, like uh, riding through like Nevada and uh, California in the areas where you get a massive strong headwind, the gas mileage on the Tiger depletes massively. Um, poor Dodger who bought my Tiger got to experience that firsthand when he took it home. <laughs> All right, moving, moving right along. Um, Lee the Rogue asks, what piece of gear do you wish you had that you didn't bring on the trip? And would you have swapped anything out? Um, I think Jeffrey Jones 2000 also asked, like, what you wish that you had had on the trip. Um... I will say that like, my tent did amazing, so I was kind of worried about like taking a brand new trip, a brand new trip, brand new tent on a longer trip. Oh my god, it's already starting. <laughs> um, I was worried about bringing a brand new tent on a trip that I had only like camped in once, um, but I think that this tent is amazing. It went above and beyond everything that I asked it to do. And I think it is my new favorite tent. And I own like eight now. So, <laughs> um, thing that I wish that I had had, um, I think that I did a really good job about bringing all the tools that I needed, um, short of a torque wrench. At one point, I really wish that I had a torque wrench, but, um, thing that was actually like forefront in my mind during the trip was that I really wish that I brought a telephoto lens. <laughs> I know that has nothing to do with the bike or like camping or anything that's like purely with documenting the trip, but I really, really wish that I had a telephoto lens for a lot of moments on the trip. Um, just like getting a zoom in shot of like prairie dogs while we were in Badlands, um, getting a better shot of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, they are called the Blue Ridge Mountains, right? I so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I can't remember if I was there. So yeah. Having like a longer lens just to capture those things better and in more focus, like that, that was really the thing that I missed the most. And I worked really hard to like uh, narrow down the lenses that I even took on this trip. Unfortunately, I broke my 28 to 70 right before I went on the trip. So. I didn't have that nice zoom lens, so I ended up taking um, a, fifth, uh, 
20 to 50 um, and then my 50 prime on the trip and those were the only two lenses that I took so I didn't at any point have a longer vocal range than 50 millimeters and I felt it <laughs> Jim thank you so much for the super chat I have to make a new drink <laughs> Mom's over here, like, judging my poor, okay? <laughs> that's just, that's just gonna pour it, because it's a strong drink. Cheers, Jim! Thank you for the super chat. <laughs> oh, that one is much stronger than what I started with. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. Rod White. Do you have a custom seat on your bike? If so, what brand? I do not. I have run with the stock seat the whole time that I have on the bike. I didn't even buy the custom seat that's on Lazarus. That came with her. Um, I have heard fantastic things about... Um, oh no. It's gone. It's... Oh, drunk brain. Not yet. Not brain. Yeah, yeah. Seat Concepts. That's the brand. Uh, seat Concepts. Um, my friend Chris Fant and Nathan Fant will preach all day about how wonderful Seat Concepts is. And uh, they have much narrower seats than the CV Pattern X does. So if you guys don't know already, Chris and Nathan Fant have a channel called For the Love of Knobs. They are my wonderful friends in real life, and I highly encourage you to go check out the channel. I'll try to remember for the people who are watching this afterwards that I will link their channel in the description. Um, moving on, Malcolm Sharp, what will you be doing through the winter months and what will be your next goal or adventure? Um, in the same vein, uh, Holly, Holy Susan, um, asked me what was your high and low of the trip and what will you be doing for videos during the winter months and what's the next trip you want to do? Um, <laughs> I, um, don't plan out my content more than like a month and a half in advance so <laughs> I don't have uh, answers for you for like super winter content I will say that uh, since I was gone for 24 days I am gonna do my best to squeeze out about 10 episodes for the Fly the Magpie series so that's what you can look forward to for the next uh, two months or so about 10, 10 weeks two months or so um, will be the flight of the magpie so one episode a week um, I will be uh, interrupting that series once um, in October. I have a very special guest who has agreed to do a live stream with me, and I'm very excited for you guys to like meet her and ask her questions. Um, I haven't finalized all the details yet, so I won't share too much, but that will be happening in October, so there will be another live stream in October. I'm just I'm very excited about it. Um, but that should be the only interruption of the Fly the Magpie series, so, so, yeah. That, that's what's ha coming for the next ten weeks is all the Fly the Magpie content. Speaking of which, um, the first episode is already up for patrons, so if you would like to get a little sneaky peek preview before the rest of the world gets to see it next week for as little as one dollar, you can go over to my Patreon, link should already be down in the description. Um, and you get uh, to see the first episode before everybody else does. And I should have episode two done for our patrons by next Friday. So um, hopefully, if I can keep that pace up, um, patrons will get um, a week early than the rest of the world all the episodes. If that made sense. I don't know if it made sense, but hopefully it did. <laughs> <laughs> Mom says good enough, so... <laughs> Um, and I'm without a drink, so... And Mom doesn't even have a drink. So she is my um, sober... What do you call that? Translator. My sober translator over there in the corner. <laughs> uh, two more questions, um, and then I will hop back into the chat and grab questions from you guys. Um, Nathan G, what was one <laughs> zero crap moment you had on your trip? Um, glad you made it through Salt Lake City before the wind. I had a tree fall over my yard. Oh, I'm sorry, Nathan. Um, I must assume that that means, like, if, what moment I had where I gave zero craps. <laughs> um, that was probably 
in West Virginia, um, that beautiful campsite that I talked about, that I got there early, I set up my tent in the daylight, I thought it was the best campsite ever, it was beautiful, it was free, I got to make dinner and eat before the sun went down, I got to fly the drone a little bit, I thought that I was like on top of the world, you guys, it was the best thing ever. At 6 a.m. the next morning, it started piddling, and I was like, oh, it's fine, it'll piddle a little bit and it'll go away. It didn't. It got worse. Um, it, like, ugh. <laughs> I'm still too close to the event, obviously. <laughs> um, eventually, I had to pee, so I was like, well, crap, like, I can't wait forever. I'm gonna have to get out of my tent in the rain to go pee. Uh, so as soon as I got out of the tent, I went to pee, and I went back to my tent, I realized the whole campsite was a giant puddle. Like, there was, like, a good half inch to an inch of water all the way through my campsite. And on top of that, I had left my kitchen stuff on top of the picnic table, so all of that stuff was soaked. <laughs> uh, I kind of, like, accepted that there was no point. I wasn't going to escape the day dry, period. And so I packed everything up. Um, that was part of the thing that I was just so glad that I took this specific tent with me because um, the rainfly uh, can be left up and you can break down the bottom of the body of the tent inside the rain fly so that everything inside the tent can stay dry and you can break down the body of the tent and the body can stay dry um, and then you can t take down the rain fly and the frame separately and so like everything that was in my duffel was dry and then I was able to pack down the rest of it um, and my ground sheet separately and put that on the outside of my tent so that outside of my duffel so that not everything else was getting wet. Um, that was also the day that I had the worst gear failure ever. My scorpion suit, which had done like amazing in the first two uh, rainstorms that I went through in Wisconsin, just utterly failed <laughs> in West Virginia and Virginia. Um, to give the suit some kind of credit, it was a horrendous downpour. <laughs> it was really bad. I like only, could only go about 25, 30 miles per hour because I couldn't see because there was so much fog. I was going through these like ups and downs and curvy hills and I like thought for sure and that was before I changed my tire so it was like on pretty much a ball tire on the rear. So I thought that I was going to die if I went any faster. You know that, that feeling? I hope that you know that feeling. <laughs> Everybody should experience this feeling. <laughs> um, and when I met, got to the first town, that was like the first time that I was like, I am not going as far as I plan today. I'm going to find the first hotel and I am stopping and drawing everything out. I do not even care that it is noon. I'm, I can't, can't go on because there was like water down my front. My like whole chest was wet. My pants were wet down to the knees, like under my, my suit. Um, it was the most miserable feeling. I have ever had. Like, this tops, like, my wet boots on the pilgrimage, okay? Most, most miserable. <laughs> um, and I went through three towns. I passed, like, six hotels that were boarded up and wrapped in, like, do not cross tape. And, like, every time I saw a hotel, like, my, I was like, oh my god, this is it. I'm going to be able to stop. I'm going to be dry, like, Oh my god, this, this is, it's gonna happen. And then I would get close enough and realize that, like, it was closed. Period. <laughs> I was just like, it would just, like, fight crying in my helmet because I was, like, so beyond, like, caring about anything. Um, it wasn't until I got to Stanton, Virginia, that I finally found a hotel. It was the uh, Holiday Inn Express. It had only been open for three months, so it was really expensive. Definitely not the most expensive hotel I've stayed in, but it was it was up there for me. Um, <laughs> and I walked in at like 2 p.m. and I like went up. I like I had a puddle around me because I didn't want to take anything off and get like my the insides more wet than they already were in case she told me no. And so I felt awful because like by the time that she was done checking me in. Like, I legit had a puddle around me on the floor <laughs> in their lobby. Um, they were the most nice humans, though. Like, uh, they let me use, like, the luggage rack, even though 
all of my luggage was soaking and covered in like straw and dead leaves and mud. They were so nice and like did everything they could to accommodate me. <laughs> um, also, like the nicest room that I stayed in on that whole trip and um, since it was so new, they had like a ton of USB plug power outlets instead of having to have a wall outlet. So I was able to charge like literally everything that I had because I only took two wall plugs with me on the trip. Um, so I was able to charge everything. I spent the whole afternoon like lounging in that hotel. I did not care one bit what anybody thought about me um, because I was like up to that point in the trip I was really worried. I was like oh my god people are going to call me fake because I only camped like a handful of times in this trip because finding camping has been so hard. Um, because I was essentially like following uh, main thorough routes and I wasn't getting off of the like main road a whole lot so finding camping was a nightmare so I stayed in like way more hotels than I have ever stayed on in, like in any of my trips so in my head I'm like freaking out I'm like oh people are gonna call me fake or gonna call me like a poser because I've been hoteling it this whole time and like that day in Virginia it was like my zero I do not care I am beyond it now. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, last one, and then I'll hop back in the chat, you guys. Um, Red Lion asked, "How do you do the aerial shots?" Um, I have a Mavic Air drone, and that's how I get all of my aerial shots. Um, I really only flew the drone a couple of times this trip, although still, <laughs> based on previous trips where I did take the drone. It's still a lot more flying than I normally do. I'm getting much better at like forcing myself to stop and take the time to set up the drone. Um, because like once you get going down the road, like anything that takes more than a couple seconds for you to pull out and do is like a major hurdle mentally. Be like, no, it's worth the time to stop and set up and do the thing. Um, which is part of the reason for this trip, like I did um, cut out foam so that my big camera could just be really easy to pull out and put back in. Um, and part of the reason I was able to do that is because like the new Wolfman 2020 line is 100% waterproof so I didn't have to keep my nice camera in a dry bag inside of the tank bag to make sure that it wasn't going to get wet um, during a trip and even through the downpour and like uh, I think I went through four rainstorms in total and one snowstorm during the trip nothing in my tank bag or any of my other gear uh, for that matter ever got wet um, inside of my Wolfman bag so huge huge thank you to Wolfman for all of their support and I, the tank bag is like probably like my favorite, favorite piece of gear from the new line up. Um, anyway, okay, hopping back into the stream. Um, lots of, oh my when, gosh. When are you doing the book? A book? <laughs> they want a book. Everybody wants a book. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. Uh, you can read um, my brain dump journal pages. Um, patrons have access to my journal pages. Um, they're very lengthy and not very grammatically correct and I'm sure there's a lot of spelling errors because it really is just like me writing like just brain dumping everything out of the page. Um, so if you want like a more in-depth description of the trip that like little things that probably won't make it into the videos like that's a good option. Um, again, you only have to be on the dollar tier to get access to those journal pages. Um, I thought about it, like, I thought, like, well, maybe I'll just, like, finish off the journal pages. I think that I, I'm only up to, like, halfway through the trip. I have a couple more to finish out. Um, I did do a lot of, like, keyword dumps during the trip so I could make sure that I, like, I remembered everything that I wanted to when I got back so that I could fill out those um, so they make more sense to anybody else but me. <laughs> Um, I thought about, like, once I finish doing all those journal pages, like, sending them to an editor and being like, here you go, <laughs> clean this up for me, please. <laughs> and, like, doing some kind of ebook. Um, that's, like, the only, that, that's it. I have no timeline for you. I make zero promises, but I have thought about it. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, where? Oh gosh, I've missed a lot, haven't I? Yes. <laughs> That's why I come past it going, I see a lot of book. Hi, Sean! 
I did answer your question first thing, so just so you know, I did. <laughs> Get another drink, yep. <laughs> I don't have a glass for you. I, I guess I, I could pour one in the Coke can for you. No, I've seen how you pour. <laughs> See, I hope you heard that. Mom doesn't want me to pour her a drink because she doesn't like the way that I make drinks. They're a little bit on the heavy side, I think. Um, what camera do you shoot with? Um, I have the Sony A7R2. And then I also took the Sony A5100 on this trip. I um, kind of jerry-rigged a fix. Um, those of you who have been around for a really long time will probably know that a while ago, I the, the 5100 actually is the camera that I shot all the pilgrimage on, um, like all the handheld stuff. Um, I had a Contour Rome two for all the helmet cam footage on the pilgrimage and then everything else that was shot on the pilgrimage was done on this little sony a5100 and uh i think it was a year ago year and a half ago um i was shooting it in the garage and my cat came in and pulled on some cords and this camera went lens first into the ground destroyed the screen um, destroyed the lens that I was using, um, and I did a GoFundMe, and we made enough money in like two days for me to buy this Sony A7R2 off of a very amazing friend, uh, Hazer, um, and they have a little channel here on YouTube called um, Doctor and the Dropout, and he's an amazing photographer, by the way. So if you follow him on Instagram at Hazer Live, yes, yes. Um, you can follow his amazing photography in Montana. He's one of my favorite people. I think that I've gone out of focus again. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, uh, bought, a, I was determined not to just, like, get rid of this body because, like, the internals are good. It's just, like, the screen was totally broken and useless. Um, I had to get a different lens for it. So I bought... Um, just the LCD panel off of eBay and kind of <laughs> redneck fixed it. So I attached the new screen and then I put packing tape over the back. <laughs> but hey, it works. It worked. Um, and so this was my second camera during the trip. I took the A7R2. Uh, um, I had two GoPros during the trip. I have the GoPro Hero 7 Black. And then right before the trip, I bought the GoPro Hero 5. Um, I bought like a used one off of Amazon because it was super cheap, and that w that is the um, my handlebar view camera. When you start seeing the episodes, I had the Mavic Air, and uh, I did have uh, the Sina 10C Evo. I don't know how much footage I actually took on that because at like one part of the trip I totally forgot that it was even there because I was like listening to headphones. <laughs> um, I think that's all the cameras I took on this trip. Quite a few cameras for a normal human. <laughs> uh, and then there is a little little bit of footage from my phone um, when stuff happened that I like forgot to bring my main camera with me or something like that. Um, Critter, thank you so much for the super chat. Love what you do and who you are. Critter number three wants to be an artist like you and Critter number four wants to adventure like you. Oh, cheers, you guys. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, lots of cameras. So many cameras. <laughs> yes, your air is cleared out some. Oh, yes. Um, for those who are concerned about the fire situation, um, they seem to be holding the uh, perimeter of the fire right now, so I am no longer in an evacuation zone. Um, we had a thunderstorm uh, a day ago? Two days ago? Uh, Friday morning. Friday morning. Um, early, early Friday morning, like 3 a.m. <laughs> we got a thunderstorm, and that's cleared out a lot of the smoke, so our air is no longer hazardous. It's like in the moderate slash unhealthy range, depending on which website you're looking at. Um, but it's amazing. We can see the sky again. Just never underestimate how nice it is to be able to see the sky. We have somebody stuck in buildings, I think. So they should be getting air. Oh, good, yes. Um... Let's see. I lost that one. You lost it. 
I know that I saw Lee had another question. Question for later. How do you feel going back to normal at back to normal life after accomplishing a journey like this? <laughs> um that was an excellent question. Um it's kind of like uh, this sounds terrible. I was gonna say like it's kind of like a normal routine at this point, like going on a trip, coming back home, um, using the footage that I shot and being able to edit that and like relive it after the fact as a way to avoid post-trip depression because I'm essentially reliving the trip all over again, just re-editing the episodes for you guys, um, and that has helped a lot. Uh, every every trip that I take, even like the short ones to Montana and back. Um, having that short reprieve from a day job um, and coming back and not having like anything else to do, just like kind of flat flop, that is really tough on me. So having the YouTube channel, being able to document those trips and then come back and edit them for you guys and being able to essentially relive my trip like over again while editing it like has really reduced like the amount of time that I spend like sad or depressed because I have to go back to normal life. Um, uh, so it's more like I come back and like going back to normal life is just kind of like a breakup like in the bad parts of traveling like being tired all the time not getting to sleep in my own bed um, <laughs> or at least those are like the bad parts for me personally um, <laughs> I know a few people will disagree with me I'm sure Tim will disagree with me <laughs> um, but, and like getting to see my family again after being away for like two weeks or however long. Um, like coming back from this trip it was just really amazing to see my boyfriend again. And like my mom and dad came to visit. Um, so I got to see them when I got like just a, like a week after I got back, mom and dad came to visit. So that's been really, really nice. Um, trying to like focus on like the good parts of being home and like everyday life is important when like avoiding the post-trip depression um, after getting back from a big trip. Um, I know that some people were wondering if like if I was like feeling like oh well I did this thing I, I like if I wanted to keep going or not um, and actually once I got to like Texas I really just wanted to be home. <laughs> um, I Getting to meet Eric and Lisa Hogan from Wolf My Luggage and seeing Cynthia from The Fat Nomad again. That was amazing. I wouldn't trade that for the world. I am a little bit disappointed that I missed some of the stuff that I wanted to see in Colorado because of the fires, but that just means I have to go back. Um, and like that's a good thing because I'll get to go back and I'll have more time to dedicate to those things. I don't know if I answered the question or not, but... <laughs> Got long I did get long-winded, that happens. <laughs> Do you use a motorcycle route planner or just something like Google Maps? Um, so before the trip, um, I normally make a route on multiple different applications. So I'll make a route in Road Trippers, and I'll make a route in Rubber, and then I'll make a route in Google My Maps. Um, because I can uh, add more ticks on uh, Google My Maps than I can on Rubber. Um, last time I checked anyway, <laughs> they keep updating rubber, so, like, I don't know if the information I'm giving you is up to date or not, so, <laughs> um, I like roadtrippers.com because they have a lot of, like, weird, quirky roadside attractions that a lot of other websites don't have, um, I like rubber because you can optimize it for, like, the twistiest roads, and it'll show you, like, the best, like, motorcycle roads that are nice and twisty, they have really excellent views, that kind of stuff. Um, but while I'm actually en route, I normally just like uh, pull up Google Maps and then I can dictate whether I want it to be um, highway or if I want it to be like only like off the, off the highway and that kind of stuff. Um, I will go back and check the Google My Maps route because that's the app that works the best on my phone and it doesn't take up um, a lot of data. I did use Rever the whole time that I was on the pilgrimage so that I could uh, record the whole route that I did, um, but that did take a lot of data. <laughs> and so like if you have a cat plan, it's not like the most uh, friendly option um, unless you go through and you like download 
a big section of map. And that's what I did when we were running Carl's Mystery Rides. I would like make the route in rubber and then I would download the big like area that we were going to be in off offline so that we could see it even when we weren't in service. Um, that is a lot of uh, the complaints that I hear about rubber is that like once you get um, out of service, like it stops working. The, uh, the secret to that is to download the area offline. So um, I think that was also a very long-winded answer to that question. <laughs> Good job, Amanda. Did I see that I got another super chat? Jamie, thank you for the super chat. Or James, I'm sorry. Did I mention that I need to get glasses, you guys? <laughs> I tried to give her mine. Mom did try to give me hers. Ironically, I can see out of the regular part of Mom's glasses, and I don't know if that's a sign of just how awful my eyesight has gotten. <laughs> Are you making insinuations? <laughs> this isn't pick on Mom. This is pick on Amanda. Right. I'm sorry. This is... I'm going backwards. <laughs> Um, the Adventurers, how's the wrist? Uh, actually, my wrist did amazing. I was so worried about it. <laughs> it wasn't until, um, I did that long day from Memphis to Texas. That was the day my wrist actually started hurting pretty badly. Um, but I don't know how much of that was, like, going from the heat and then riding all, like, I started in Memphis in the morning and I didn't get to Amarillo, Texas until, like, midnight. So there was a big chunk where I was riding in the dark and with the wind, chill and everything, it got pretty chilly. So I don't know how much of it was just like the temperature fluctuation so drastically, um, which is why my wrist acted up. But other than that day, I had zero issues with my wrist, which was amazing. Um, very proud of how it healed. How much footage do you take a day and do you find it overwhelming on a multi-day trip? Uh, I don't know how much footage I take a day. I know once I downloaded everything to um, my computer, I had about 800 gigabytes of footage. I had to uh, dedicate one whole terabyte hard drive just to the footage from this trip. <laughs> um, I think that I only filled up like 128 gig of from the 5100, and then I think uh, two or three. Uh, from the A7R2, but like most of that footage is just like the raw footage from the GoPro Hero 7. I, I, I want to say that I had filled up like five, 528 gig, don't quote me, <laughs> the micro SD cards from the GoPro Hero 7. It felt like I went through a lot um, for the GoPro, which makes sense because like uh, when I use the A7R2 and the 5100, it's very succinct short clips. Like, I know that I want to get this, like, one shot, and I get, like, I'll shoot it, like, three times to make sure I get one that works, and that's it. Or, like, my talking head stuff with the big camera, which is why I filled up, like, a, a few more cards than I did on the A7R2. Um, but, like, with the GoPro, I really, I don't know what part is going to work, so... I will turn it on, I'll get like a couple shots for like, I don't know, like five minutes. I think the longest clip that I have from the, in, on the GoPro was like 15 or 20 minutes and that was when I was riding around with Megan Stark because I wanted to get all of it and <laughs> so I could relive it later. Um, uh, and then like the hel helmet bar camera, um, or handlebar camera, oh my goodness, helmet bar? Wow, that's, that's a good one. I'm going to have to remember that. Yep. <laughs> From the handlebar camera, those were never really more than like two or three minute clips. Um, I try to keep all of those clips short because it makes it much easier to edit. Um, yeah, I think that answers that question. <laughs> I don't, I forgot where I was. Let's see. How much room does the Mavic Air take up? Uh, it's about this big. You have no way of knowing how big that is. Um, it's about the size of my head. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she has a slightly large head. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. You're welcome. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, if I was going to, like, I could put it in my tank bag. Um, that's how big, like, it takes up. I do have three extra batteries for it, so... 
Um, we're not just talking about the drone itself, we're talking about the drone, the controller for the drone, three batteries, and then um, the charger for those batteries. Um, so I think that it would take up about like half of my tank bag. Um, it really doesn't take up a whole lot of space. Ah, that's the point <laughs> of that statement. I did have the DJI Phantom 3 at one point, and that took up a whole backpack on its own. It was huge, which is part of the reason I decided to like make the investment and upgrade to the Mavic Air, because it was so much more packable. I would be able to keep it in a place where it wouldn't take as much effort to stop and set it up and use it. Um, I think that I really only used the Mavic the Phantom 3 like maybe three times on a trip because it was just too huge. It was too much of a hassle to unstrap from the bike, open it up, set it up, do the compass dance, and then fly. With the Mavic, I kind of like, I normally keep it in um, a saddle bag. So under the saddle bag, pull it out, set it up, do the compass dance, and then fly. It's a much shorter span of time to be able to set up and then break it back down and put it away. Beggars and Brews, thank you so much for the super chat. Cheers, you guys. We have a navicular mini. It's perfect. Is that what that says, Mom? It's what it looks like. Navicular mini. What is, what is, is that a drone? Teach me things. <laughs> okay. Have you tried the new Tiger 900? I upgraded from the 800 World of Change. I have not got to test ride the new hunter yet. I'm extremely jealous. I've heard very good things. Um, from what I can tell though, it still has a like, kind of similar issue to the 800 where that gas tank comes up in horseshoes. So all the weight is still pretty high up um, because they didn't move where the air filter is. But um, from what I have heard, they did do a couple other things to make a lot of the weight move a lot farther down on the bike than the Classic 800 does. Um, let me see. Somebody asked if you were mostly running highways or s split it with two lane roads. I don't know if you answered. I can't remember if you answered that or not. Um, if I asked... Scott asked that. Okay, so um, I did run freeways most of the time just because I was trying to make time. Um, I <laughs> was hyper aware of how much mileage I needed to do in a very short period of time. So uh, Gary and I did a lot of secondary highways. So from um, Montana to Rapid City, we did a lot of secondary highways and a little bit of freeway time. Um, from uh, South Dakota to Wisconsin, I was kind of hopping on the freeway, getting off when I got tired and getting back on when I realized what time it was that I needed to still make it another 200 miles. Um, I tried hard to like be aware of my comfort zone and where I was like fatigue wise. If I was aware that I was getting tired, I knew that I needed to get off the freeway and spend time not going 80 miles per hour. Uh, Nathan, thank you so much for the super chat. Cheers. Well, thanks. Bruce says a Mavic. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks for the answer. You made sense of the zero caps given. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> and the zero, zero crap moments. Yes. Thank you. I'm glad that that made sense. <laughs> um, but yeah, I <laughs> spent most of the time on my freeway. On, on my freeways? They're my freeways. Uh, good job, Amanda. Jeez, what time is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, oh, we're, we're we're coming up on an hour, you guys. So um, <laughs> about we're like what do we say? Like ten, twenty minutes, and then I'll, I'm gonna end this so that everybody who watches this afterwards uh, <laughs> can maybe make it to the end. If they're they're very dedicated, they'll make it to the end. <laughs> Given the speed that your rear sprocket wore out, have you now switched to a steel sprocket? Yes! <laughs> See, I didn't even mention that, that it was an aluminum sprocket before. Good catch, Bill. <laughs> um, yeah, that's part of the reason the rear uh, wore out so quickly, That because when I changed everything in September last year, it was an aluminum sprocket. So the sprocket that I replaced it with is steel, and it still has lots of life left, which makes me pretty happy. 
<laughs> what time is it? Time for another drink. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Names of bikes. No, Amanda's. Okay, cool. That was that. That's the group question. Maybe that should be the end screen crew question. Yes. Okay. Yes. Everybody who makes it to the end of the live stream who is watching this after the fact must put the name of your bike in the comments so that I know that you made it this far into the stream watching it after the fact. That is the end screen crew question. Thank you, Willows. <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Definitely time for another drink as I cheers with a water bottle. <laughs> Did you feel rushed on the trip? Do you wish you could have had unlimited time? Um, I think having the time limit was good because it gave me uh, kind of a feeling of uh, I knew what my end goal was. Like I had a reason to keep going. Does that make any kind of sense? I don't know if it makes sense. Um, I had a mission. That's what I mean. Um, I did feel a little bit rushed, especially when I got to the East Coast and I wanted to spend more time um, experiencing the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, um, Blue Ridge Parkway, um, I, I missed uh, Tail of Dragon and Natchez, Natchez Parkway. Um, I didn't get to go to Charleston uh, because of the rainstorm, it kinda took a little bit of time off. Um, I was also like two days behind where I was supposed to be like the whole trip because brother took the wrong time off, which is partially my fault, partially his fault. It was like two way street there. <laughs> you talk to mom. <laughs> Sean, thank you for the super chat, Sean. Okay, last drink. <laughs> Hotels are awesome. Cold and wet sucks. Glad you overall had a great time. Yes. Also, I will say um, that even though, oh, that's a heavy pour. Yeah, that's why you don't pour my drinks. <laughs> I will say that even though I stayed at hotels most of the time, um, I can probably count on one hand the amount of times that I ended up camping for this whole trip. I still came in under budget, you guys. <laughs> that's how awesome I am. <laughs> No, that has more to do with the fact that like gas was so much cheaper than um, I budgeted for it because I was doing all the math for like budgeting for gas, for food, all those things like pre-pandemic um, and gas is a lot cheaper than when I did all the math to budget for the trip. So um, between not getting to do all of the um, kind of side things that I wanted to do and then the, ch the gas being cheaper. The fact that I had to go to all those hotels would kind of like even out my budget, but I still came in under budget, which is super cool. Say hi to Doodle. Doodle is here! Hello! Oh my god, hi! And if Jennifer said hello, you inspired me to trade in my little bike for an adventure bike. Thank you. Oh my god! That is the sweetest thing ever! Oh! Damn, that's awesome! Oh, that's so cool! <laughs> Really quick, Asphalt Diva. I'm planning my first big trip for next year, Central Florida, the Sturgis, for my 50th birthday. That's that is so cool. I love I love this. This is amazing. That that is so awesome. Doodle, thank you so much for hosting me at your home. It was so lovely to see you. I want everybody to know that Doodle is like just as adorable probably more adorable in person than she is in her videos. I'm just saying. <laughs> also, I kept her up past her bedtime like a very bad person. <laughs> I feel like all of the rest of like my female like fellow moto vloggers are like wonderful, amazing morning people and I am a night owl and I kept them up all past their bedtime because I'm awful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mom agrees. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, would you like to be a Tennessee Squire? Do you know what? I have no idea what that is. I'm hopping all over the place now. Uh, <laughs> let's see. That was a question for Doodle. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Doodle interviewed me for like, what was it, like two hours or something? <laughs> 
yeah, an hour. <laughs> I hope that, like, any of that is usable. I realized, like, after the fact, even, like, watching my footage back from that interview, like, we did it in her kitchen, so it was super echoey. So I hope that it's usable. More adorable can't be. That, that's true. She's, like, peak level of adorable. Let me, like, hop up and see if I can find a question that I missed earlier. Uh, if you have to estimate, how many miles do you say you do weekly, assuming you're not on a special trip? So I'm assuming that you mean, like, when I'm home? Um, oh my gosh. Gush? Gushness? Good. <laughs> um, miles I do uh, on a week average when I'm not on a trip when I'm just at home probably like 120 I don't like that's gonna be my guess um, I like probably like not in the next few weeks because I'll be focusing on editing the trip that I just did but normally like if I don't have footage backed up from like a longer trip to edit um, I normally do at least one ride a week to like go to a place so that I can film for you guys and then I come back. And normally most of those places are at least 40 miles away, um, sometimes longer. So um, I'm normally doing at least 120 miles a week um, like just to like do the special ride to film and come back and then like whatever like little ride I'll do during the week. I don't normally commute to work because I'm only 10 minutes from work and it feels really silly to like suit up ride like I don't even know like four miles to work and then uh, unsuit to go like be at work and then have to put it all back on to go four miles um, I did buy a moped for my brother so that I could like uh, ride to work on that and I've done that a couple times which is fun but uh, for the most part I just drive my truck to work because it's just such a short 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 commute <laughs> like <laughs> um, if you guys haven't watched it already, Doodle did a 20 way, 21 day challenge where she uh, commuted to work on her motorcycle. Um, and she had a couple of rules where she excluded like days where it was raining or she felt unsafe or if she was doing recycling and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's a really wonderful video. You guys should go check it out. I'll try to link it in the description for those who are watching this after the fact. Um, she's she's awesome but i'm but i'm sure her commute to work is a little bit longer than four miles <laughs> willow says there's 143 people watching what that's crazy I've got 146. 140 what thank you guys so much for being here i appreciate all of you you're wonderful make sure you hit that like button No cameos, sorry. Am I the only one who thinks Doodle and her two wheels need to ride out to Montana except for- Yes! Ah, for those who don't know, I host a thing called Rocky Mountain Roll on my family's property every July. Well, you moved it, so- I did move it this year, but it, it did start in July. Yep, end of Move July. It moved into August during the weekend, but um, I host a motorcycle camp out on my family's ranch in Montana every end of July, we're gonna say. This year was our fifth year. We still had like 47 people show up, which was incredible. Um, we capped the event at 100 people to make sure that like everybody gets to, gets to know each other. Like at no point do you feel like an anon anonymous person in a crowd. Um, and it's a very chill weekend. We added a day this year and I think it was really nice. So I think we're gonna stick with it. We're gonna do four days um, next year too. And uh, it's very chill, like there's no bands, there's no um, uh, merch tents or anything like that besides what you can buy from us for the event to just support the event so it keeps happening. Um, just don't piss mom off. Yeah, just don't piss mom off so we can keep doing it. <laughs> mom checks you in at the gate, it's a very family run affair. It's literally just me, mom and dad, and Gary helps sometimes. It depends on how he's feeling. And his work schedule. Yeah, his work schedule. Um, we go up to Missoula just about every single year to the Montgomery Distillery. Um, they make Montana rye whiskey. They're my favorite human beings. Um, other than that, like, you just hang out. We have pizza Saturday night together. Grandma comes for check-in, yes. too. My grandmother comes for a check-in. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a very, like, grassroots family thing. 
Also, I just missed a super chat. Mark, thank you so much for the super chat. Cheers. <laughs> I think that um, Doodle might have to like fly in for that though. I'm not um, uh, dismissing your skills, Doodle, but I think it might be more uh, up your alley to fly in, rent a bike, and come to the event. It would also probably work much better for your work schedule as well. <laughs> As someone who taught survival, I always wonder if you find limit yourself to a set, wait, if you limit yourself to a set limit set of tools or gear. Um, so I have uh, those new rollies that I put on my engine guards, so all my tools fit in one of those rollies. I don't know how many liters it is. I want to say that there are 10 liter bags, but I might be wrong. Um, I have a tool roll, so all of my main tools fit in that tool roll, but there are a couple things that don't fit in it, like the sockets for my rear axle. Um, I have an extra, um, yep. I'm on my third drink, please. I thought it was the fourth. Is it the fourth one? No, no. <laughs> third, sorry. Um, to answer that question, all my tools and like the rags and everything to work on my bike have to fit in that 10 liter rolly bag. I don't put tools anywhere else in the bike. Um, I do have uh, an air pump now, thanks to a wonderful person who bought it on my Amazon wish list for me. Um, so I have the air pump and then my tools in the tool roll, the extra sockets for my rear axle, um, an extra uh, socket wrench, that's what it was. Um, probably a different word for that than what I use for it, but yes. Um, there is a set amount of space for my tools, which is part of the reason I didn't bring a torque wrench this time. Um, I didn't have the space for it. Um, hopefully uh, in the future I'll be able to find a shorter torque wrench that will fit in that rolly bag, um, and then I'll, pro I'll be covered. Um, I've done a lot of work on the bike on the road, and uh, that seems to be the only thing that I feel like I'm missing right now anyway. <laughs> Knock on wood. Rocky Mountain Roll is definitely on my moto bucket list. One day, one day for surreals. Yay! I would love that. I would love that. Doodle, thank you for the super chat. Cheers, my friend. Would a cruiser be able to make the trip your adventure did as smoothly? Would it be a challenge for a Harley example? I think that Harley could do the trip that I did. Um, I did go off-road a little bit um, just to change things up a bit. Um, the camp that I did in West Virginia was off-road, but it really wasn't more than a mile down a dirt road. A Harley could definitely do it. Um, I did a lot of off-roading on my Haunt of Shadow, and I'm sure that it's very similar. Um, we have baggers come to Rocky Mountain Roll every single year, and uh, the road from, the, from uh, the main road down to our house is a dirt section. Um, so if you go slow and easy, you can do just about anything on any bike. You just have to try hard enough. That's it. <laughs> but yes, the Harley could definitely do the trip that I did. The Falco! Thank you so much! Cheers! Thank you for being a role model and an inspiration to riders everywhere. Thank you, Falco. Did you answer what was your favorite sleeping camping mattress? What is my favorite sleeping pad? Epidemic. Um, I don't know if I can accurately answer this question. For back, back information, um, I've had three or four sleeping pads um, in my experience motorcycle camping. One was an Intex air mattress from Walmart. Um, that was the twin air mattress that I took on the pilgrimage. That was awful. Like, great for sleeping when it was hot, but any time that it was below 50 degrees outside, since there was no insulation in those Entex air mattresses, it was so terrible. And I'm a cold sleeper, it doesn't matter how warm your sleeping bag is, you're going to freeze your butt off because all the air under your body is cold. Um, so that's great if, like, it was going to be 80 the whole time you're out, even in the dark. Um, but, <laughs> even in the dark, even at night, I should say. Um, but other than that, I would never, I would never recommend an Intex air mattress for a motorcycle camping. Uh, the next sleeping pad that I got is an, uh, Climate B Lux. And that was actually a pretty good sleeping pad, apart from the fact that you could only blow it up with your mouth. I ended up giving that sleeping pad to my brother. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, he, he likes it just fine. So there's that. Um, that is the sleeping pad that I took to Babes Are Out the first time. Um, for year five of Babes Are Out, that is the sleeping pad that I took. Mom is giggling in the corner. I need to finish answering the question first, okay? <laughs> That's because I was reading somebody else's question for me. Jeez. <laughs> um, uh, I ended up giving that sleeping pad to my brother, not because I found something better, but because I uh, ended up working with Next Adventure, and they gave me credit to like buy some gear to review for their blog. So that's when I got the X-Pad Sinmat 7, and that has by far been my favorite sleeping pad that I have have had thus far. I think, I want to say the R-Value rating is like between 3 and 4, I want to say it's like a 3.7 or something like that. It was warm, I'm a cold sleeper, so that was very important for me to have a sleeping pad that had good insulation in it. The climate was okay, but it's not, it's definitely not a 3 on the R-Value scale. Um, it's like wide enough for me as a side sleeper to like roll over and like curl up like my kind of like the, t the corners of my knees will hang off but like the rest of my body is still on the sleeping pad um that sleeping pad got a couple holes in it at babes are out last year this babes are out seven i got uh, a couple holes in my sleeping pad because of the poor conditions that they had us camped in <laughs> Um, so I'm still working on finding all of the holes and patching them, so I knew that I needed to get a different sleeping pad between then and this trip. So I got the Big Agnes, uh, insulated Q-Core, actually I think I have it with me. Ta-da! Big Agnes insulated Q-Core sleeping pad, um, off of the REI outlet website. Um, I think I ended up paying like 70 some dollars for the sleeping pad because it was on the outlet. Um, it has a very high uh, R value. I think I want to say it's a, like more of a four. So it is insulated better than the X Pad was, but it is much narrower when it is uh, blown up and everything. So I do have issues like when I'm curled up um, in the fetal position that like my knees stick off the pad. It's either like my knees are sticking off or my butt is sticking off the pad. Um, that is my main complaint with this sleeping pad. If you're a back sleeper, this is awesome. Um, if you are a cold sleeper, this is awesome. Um, at no point was I cold ever while I was camping on this trip. And in West Virginia, it did get pretty cold that night. And I had no issues with that. Um, so I think that I would say the x -Ped is my favorite. We're over an hour. We're, we're over an hour? Yeah, we're at 6.41. Lots of people want to know where the tent is set up. Where this? Where's your tent Oh, is. where my tent is. We are in my office. <laughs> in Milwaukee, Oregon. Um, I, uh, you know, the video, like the last video that I posted, the last update, um, from the trip where I said, I'm home. Ta-da. We're in the same room that I filmed that video in. Okay. The, does that make sense? With the, the bookshelves in the back and that kind of stuff. I just do my best to use the rain fly to strategically cover the background so we can all pretend that we're camping together, even though we're in my house. <laughs> I just think it's a more interesting background. I don't know. The babe, not the babes right out in New York, Stuart. It was the one on the West Coast. Um, the first babes right out that I went uh, year five was in Joshua Tree. They had to change locations um, year seven, and they were in Santa Margarita. I want to say California, Central California, Central California. Um, the last year that I went. Do I carry bear spray? Wendy, I have like a whole video that's like literally tired titled Do I Carry Bear Spray? <laughs> Your, the simple answer is no, I don't carry bear spray. I did carry bear spray on the pilgrimage because I did camp in a lot of areas with like that were bear active. Um, my tip for everybody who uh, is worried about that is talk to yourself a lot. It's a lot cheaper than $50 for a can of bear spray. Um, most of the people who I encourage to carry bear spray are people who are gonna like start hiking in the back and like in the wilderness or in the backcountry. Um, when I stopped at the Montana Grizzly Encounter, like even them, like who have direct experience with bears, recommend you talking to yourself. It's so much more effective than carrying bear spray because speech, like us talking, is like the only way for bears to identify that that is a human. Um, and so, like, don't carry a bear bell or a whistle, like, that, or, I mean, like, 
emergency whistles are important, but like not a bear whistle is what I mean. Um, Because if you carry a bear bell, like they're going to be like, oh, what's that? That sounds interesting. What? Like, it's a curiosity thing. So then like they go looking for it. If you're talking to yourself or if you sing to yourself, um, that is so much more effective at uh, um, not avoiding bears, but um, keeping bears away. And then also, it's very important if you're going to camp in a very active area to never eat food inside your tent. Don't leave food inside your tent. Um, you either do a good bear hang or you carry a bear-proof container and you store that away from your tent. Um, and that includes anything that has a smell as well. So any of your um, deodorants, perfumes, um, uh, sunscreen lotion, anything like that needs to also go in your food bag and be stored away from your tent because they don't know that you know your banana flavored or banana scented sunscreen isn't also food um yeah that's that's what i have to say about that (laughs) when you take these cool pictures of you the bike and an awesome background do you use your drone or a camera i've always wondered (laughs) um there are a couple pictures that i have taken recently that were with my drone and those are normally you can pretty much tell if they're from the drone because it's from a very high perspective and I'm pretty little in the picture. So like the thumbnail for the Lolo Pass video, that was a drone photo. Other than that, most of the time it's a tripod and my camera and then I have um, an app on my phone so that I can see what my phone is, what my camera is seeing. And then I can um, essentially use my phone as a remote to take the photo. Um, which is super nifty. Like all of my selfies that I took on the pilgrimage, I had to like set the 10 second timer and then run back to the bike, take the photo, run back, see if it was okay, take another one. Like it was a whole process. So um, with the uh, new Sony Alpha series, you can use your phone as a remote. You download a special app. Um, You can uh, see directly on your phone what the camera is seeing. And that's how I line up my selfies, my advanced selfies. Um, where you see me and the bike and a pretty background. Um, Most of those photos are taken with my Sony A7R II. I I think, yes, that answers that question. Did you catch any that I haven't caught, Mom? Um, Yeah, but I lost it because it vanished. What's your video video editing suite of tools? I use Premiere, um, Adobe Premiere Pro. Um, and then uh, for the maps that you guys will be seeing for the new series, those are all made in After Effects. I, I learned specially how to make animated maps for you guys in that program. All the maps before the series I was making frame by frame in Photoshop it took a lot of time. So <laughs> I'm stoked to have learned how to do it in After Effects. Um, ride fast, lift. Thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate that. Dinner Whiskey, Bear Spray. Best are value. <laughs> That's awesome. <I> thank <laughs> thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> Do you carry man spray? James wants to know that. Do I carry man spray? There was no well Yes. <laughs> I do, actually. <laughs> I think that I've talked about like my favorite pockets on those scorpion pants before. The ones that are like sit on my thighs, like right here. Those are my favorite. That's my favorite part about that suit is the pockets right here. Um, one of those pockets is like my wallet and like my um, pandemic kit, which is like my uh, hand sanitizer and my, uh, I carried a pair of gloves and uh, my mask. And then on the other pocket is like my bathroom kit and my man spray. <laughs> I carry like a go girl, like a pee funnel, and then I carry a pee rag, um, and uh, I carry. I also carry a comb in that pocket, um, but then the mace also is in that pocket, so it's easy to get at. Six forty-eight. Oh, okay, okay. We're gonna wrap up, you guys. And yes, I answered the question. Find it in the chat. Mom says that she answered the mom question in the chat, so you have to go back and find it, I guess. <laughs> Girl riders have pockets. Um, no, girl riders don't have pockets. I uh, my scorpion suit is actually the men's version. Uh, I didn't like the way the women's version looked. It had like cursive and weird swirlies on it. I'm not about that. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Falcro. I really appreciate that. 
Okay, we're... <laughs> no, wrap yeah. up, never. <laughs> Milk stout? Is that what that says? That's what it says. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Good night, people that are leaving for bed. Oh, good night, everybody who's going to bed. I'm sorry it's super late on the East Coast. I didn't realize how many of you were on the East Coast. I'm sorry. I will try to make the next stream a little bit earlier. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you for being here. Okay, everybody's heading out. So we're going to wrap up. Um, thank you so much for being here. For everybody who is watching this post stream, make sure that you hit that like and subscribe button if you like this kind of content, if you enjoy the live streams, even though you can't be here. Everybody who is here, make sure that you hit that like and subscribe button because I hope that this was some kind of entertaining. If you would like to get early access to the Flight of the Magpie episodes, for as little as one dollar a month you can support me over on patreon it is absolutely okay if you cannot support me monetarily right now i appreciate all of your guys' support so much um just being here and watching these videos every single week you have no idea how much that means to me reading your comments every week just like gives me life you guys <laughs> thank you so much um if you would like to get stickers t-shirts prints anything with my motorcycle art on them links to my Redbubble and my etsy shop which is open again are linked down in the description. And in the meantime, guys, I will see you later.